gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, the last speaker of the evening, Mr. Arthur Simone. <laughs> if I go and pause here and there, it's not because I don't like you. I'm thinking about why I don't agree with what I wrote. <laughs> <clears throat> There's a quote from T.S. Eliot I keep thinking on. We must not cease from exploration, and at the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we began and to know the place for the first time. You can say what you, what you want about Cold Town Theater and the improv that we teach here, but if you really want to tickle my fancy, you will describe it as the theatrical equivalent of a cave painting. Meaning, there's a very simple, very fundamental spirit that we do here that has everything to do about where we fit into Western theater art tradition, and yet nothing at the same time. So listen to what I say, and then disregard it. We have a small space in here. We have a small stage. Um, people are watching people do stuff. And we all exist in this realm of mutually complicit make-believe. And it's pretty fun. It's pretty funny. <laughs> there are plenty of bit shows here. And there are shows with props and lights and sound cues. That's great. Do more of it. If you have the prop and it serves to heighten or subvert the joke, get it and make it do it. But otherwise, this bare stage is your starting point. It is a gift. It is a choice when you make it. It can be beautiful when you have nothing. And so what I'm trying to single out here is a theater of minimalism that's very fresh, it's very socialist, uh, it's ultimately as old as all of humankind and all the art that we've ever done and all the bits we've ever done. They've not, they're not mutually exclusive. It's, uh, it's nothing new under the sun. It's uh, like Jericho said, the same software that everyone's loaded with. All it takes, all it's ever taken for something to be described as theater is a space, a place, a seeing place of sacrifices, prayers, jokes, or in ancient Greek, a theatron. Greeks, theater, uh, ER versus RE. Uh, theater, as a word, theatron, uh, got sucked into Roman classical design and came to mean a semicircle with tiered seating. Has anyone been to a theater, right? Uh, it doesn't mean anything anymore. I like to think of any theater or place where it, whether it's the globe or a place for donkey funk at fucking, <laughs> is a theater as in ER. So the globe theater, Coal Town theater, donkey fuck theater, all are ER. The study of the field of drama is more in line with what I think of as RE. The study of donkey funking. <laughs> I think a lot of uh, Western traditional theater history is kind of, um, from an academic point of view, uh, idiot proof and tries to elevate the idiot proof uh, voices that come along. And what we do here is, is very opposite that. You look at written theater like Shakespeare, Moliere, Pinter, Mamet, the playwright is telling you what to say and how to say it. A talented, untrained actor going head-to-head -head with an untalented, trained actor with some of this material might win on a coin flip, maybe. <laughs> the internet certainly has lent itself to an explosion and democratization of art. But these do-it-yourself forces have been around for as long as you can go back. Uh, you got pageant wagons in the Dark Ages in Europe that would roam the countryside to tell stories of hell, redemption, uh, because some idiot thought it would be great to take all these crazy-ass stories out of the church and put them on a wagon in a theater troupe and send it around. <laughs> Anyone could be in on that secret. It didn't just have to be the people in the big cities and the big abbeys. If you have a good out, uh, stage voice, good physical presence, and you have a stage, however humble and simple, it lets an audience know that this is the proper time, this is the proper place to go see a work of theater, of make-believe, in front of an audience of your peers. You can do a show in a bar, you can do a show in a street corner, underneath a video store, any hole in the wall that you please. 
The driving force of an art that serves life and lends its voice from time to time is one that listens to the people and what the people want without the pretense of expensive equipment that is otherwise only available to some sort of priest class or scholar class. I'm talking about the Dark Ages here. <laughs> We're still on the Dark Ages. <laughs> uh, but rather the people that surround us and who think and feel as we do. You look at the body of work of medieval plays commissioned by Dutch monarchs or Spanish merchants, and they're all jib-jabbing at their little political inside circles. And those plays don't really stay with us. They don't stand up. They haven't survived. They haven't been passed down. They haven't been written down because they were kind of junk. They were junk plays that were just feeding the pot of stew. Uh, the plays that stay with us after all these years are the ones that appeal to our basic human selves. Stories of young love, tragedy of war, betrayal, aging, feuds, and making amends. Commedia dell'arte was a very accessible uh, independent theater movement because you could take a character and nobody owned the character. Nobody owned the story. It was all of our stories. It was all of our characters. During the Renaissance and the advent of the printing press, archives of Greek and Roman plays became widely available. People would look at Oedipus or the 30 carries of uh, Theophastus and think, man, these, these people are thinking and talking like people. Imagine that. As opposed to rigid traditions of storytelling, of who the story, of who the hero is, who the bad guy is, how to drag the audience along and join their perspective or be shunned or shamed. Uh, here's, a, here's a fun quote by Peter Brook in his 1968 book called The Empty Space. I can take any empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across this empty space whilst someone else is watching him. And this is all that is needed for an act of theater to be engaged. Right there, Peter Brooks spelled it with an R-E, but uh, he, was, he was British, so I forgive him. Uh, after years of working with the Royal Shakespeare Company, Peter Brook also came up with this controversial notion that classical works should be performed in as contemporary a style that you could get away with while contemporary works would be performed like they were classics. Imagine, imagine going into a play not being told exactly what to expect. Baffling, right? <laughs> Peter Brook isn't alone. I'm sure within the stodgy prudish circles of the English theater, he probably felt like it. But there are lots of theater renegades that have left their mark over the last century alone. Live modern theater had this extraordinary power to start riots once upon a time. Alfred Jarry's Perubu first started in 1896, and the first word was medre, which was a play on merd, shit, shitter. <laughs> started a riot. <laughs> Art that has the power to start a riot is worth thinking about. Filippo Marinetti and his futurists took to whatever stage they could to find to irritate Italian high society with their manifestos, they were pelted by vegetables. Antonin Artaud in France, Jerzy Grotowski in Poland, Bertolt Brecht in Germany. All these directors and writers schooled in the Western tradition of theater all began to realize that the theater of their contemporaries was indeed just a place of snobbery, highly ritualized complacency, and that each of them had a hand in what became an avalanche of anti-establishment thoughts that took down the haughty notion of a well-crafted, expertly acted play, and they took that notion down. Any idiot can tell a joke, and there's something powerful in that. I don't have time to do anything but scratch the surface on those dudes. Uh, I'm happy to recommend more reading. Uh, <laughs> suffice it to say, there's a breed of theater artists that finds inspiration in the everyday, and there has always been that breed. Finding inspiration in the everyday, in the rough, the naive, the primitive, and the raw. The democratic theater starts equipped with the same physical tools as the caveman, the same software, the exact same opportunity to communicate something. This is part of the story of American improvisational theater, which I think many still think of as a low art. 
most comedy, live comedy, is thought of as low art because there's no academic classical study roadmap. There's no control over it and what makes it good and what makes it right. It's either funny or it's not. Aristotle's writings and drama outline all the peaks and valleys you have to, to hit the right thing, to hit the right mark on the right pace, the right tempo, to elicit the right human emotion. But there's no such text for comedy. And I think that's pretty fun. Improv stages, theater stages, joke stages, stand-up stages, vaudeville stages, burlesque stages. It was all a melting pot of 19th century American entertainers finding a way to build stages and holes in the wall. And they didn't need to know Theophastus to know that a pie in the face is funny. <laughs> Sid Caesar, Groucho Marx, all these guys, eventually Lenny Bruce, they all made it up as they went along. I think we're still doing that. Del Close came away from stints with vaudeville troops. He had no pretensions about the best way to reach the best audience. There's never such a thing. There's no one way to get the reaction that you want in a laugh. I mean, there are a lot of ways. Ways. <laughs> <laughs> theater traditions and educations teach us how to go deeper into patterns and ritual, sure, but you lose sight of the immediate human element that makes theater theater, and you may as well be dead meat. I don't know what that sentence is. <laughs> I went off on some tangents, but I'll bring it back. Uh, improv. Comedy improv, as I like it, it has no hierarchy. It has no playwright. It has no dramaturg. It has no lead actor or lighting designer or stage designer. It's just a simpler order of a live theatrical event in which anyone, audience or performer, can riot at any given time. <laughs> Hopefully they choose to not. It's because of this dynamic human potential that we're given the obligation and the responsibility to listen to each other, to the audience, to our hearts, and to nurture the complicit environment in which magical make-believe transcends what the academy thinks of us and transforms us into artists of the highest rank. Yep. <laughs> Well, that's it for this episode of Got Your Back's Comedy Nerd Out. We want to say thank you for watching. If you'd like to check out more episodes from us at Got Your Back Podcast, you can go to GYBpodcast.com for episodes, or you can search for Got Your Back on whatever podcasting service you use. iTunes, Stitcher, we're on all of them. If you could drop us a rate and review, we would also appreciate that as well.